And we did this picture directly after The Outsiders in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We had a two week break between the two pictures and we jumped right into this picture. We got a call from Francis, very excited, saying, come on, I want you to produce this movie. And it's written by this uh, gal, Essie Hinton, and she comes from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that's where you grew up, right? And I go, yeah. Well, when Francis first mentioned me, he would like to do another of my books and said, what have you done? I said, well, I've got this weird book called Rumblefish, but nobody understands it. I never would bring him a copy. He actually had to go out and get a copy on his own. Then he came in one day and he said, oh, Susie, I love this. It's so different from the outsiders, and you're using color symbolisms, and you're using Greek mythology. And I was going, yeah, yeah, I did that, but nobody else has ever caught on to this. Francis always said that this was an art film for the kids. That gang shoe was out of style when you was 10 years old. Oh, oh shit. Man. He was kind of going back to the old way of making movies. Francis, at that time, had this idea, which was a great idea, was you're gonna make a movie, you just make up your mind, you're gonna make it. We were setting up shop in a school, we found an empty school. Francis took the principal's office and we took different offices. We really just began to conceptualize about it. We'd sit in the room and Francis would talk to Dean Tavalaris, the production designer, Steve Durham, the cinematographer, and he'd say, you know, let's come up with stuff. And they'd do drawings and we'd sit on the electronic blackboard we would do the whole movie with, with chalk and electronic blackboard, and then we would record that on videotape from the blackboard. So it was all explored during the, the kind of pre-production time. Hey, we already got four reels done. For Francis, pre-visualization was the idea of trying to see the movie before you filmed it, before you shot it. Nobody was doing electronic cinema. It was a word that I think Francis coined. He was so much ahead of the times altogether. We started doing photographs of locations. The photographs were put all together. We videotaped the actors with the blue screen process. Oh, oh, that gang, she was out of style when you was 10 years old, Russ. No, 11, man, I can remember it. I was in the Little Warriors. Basically, the idea was that we were going to shoot the whole screenplay first and put it with the locations in a kind of very rough way so that Francis would have a preview of what the picture kind of might look like before we'd actually started principal photography. Dick Wilcox looking for you, Rusty James. No, no, I, the very first thing that happens right in the beginning was a character walks in and says, Rusty James, Biff Wilcox is gonna kill you. Saying ain't doing. And from that moment until the end, time is running out on this character. Time is a very peculiar item. Soon you're young, you're a kid, you got time, you got nothing but time. This picture is an abstract piece that has to do a lot with, with people's state of minds, and a lot of that is very difficult to portray in color, and, and black and white is a real good choice when you're trying to abstract all these things. See, now I know that he's filming this in a strange light, and <laughs> I think that's going to help the film. I mean, not help it. That is the film. In black and white, there's a big trick that you can use, and it's something that we use in the picture. Is a lot of times you can actually paint shadows onto walls, onto buildings, and things like that. We did quite a lot of that in this picture. When Matt Dillon's character goes to Diane Lane's house, you see this great big tree shadow all over the front of the house. That's not a tree shadow that's painted on, on the building. Hey, Rusty James. Hey, Diane, your sister home. Larry Fishburne first comes into the pool hall. You'll notice if you look very carefully that the light and shadow that is cast on the walls is opposite from where the windows are. And so you pick up subliminally that there's something wrong in that pool hall. These things happen, Rusty James. Maybe we should go double or nothing sometime. Sit down. You know, Rusty James is so stupid, I have to pull him out of a lot of things, you know. Yeah, he works from his heart, man, you know? Rusty James is very slow. He's not... I mean, he's not dumb. Not to say that he's dumb, he's just slow. You know, in this day and age, in our society, you gotta use your brains. I mean, your heart, right. you can't live off the heart. And, like, I have to keep telling him what to do without him getting upset at me. But, I mean, it's like, that's, that's just the way I see it. But he can't get out of that world of... Oh, he says he wants to fight me, I'll fight him, you know. That's his world, that's all, that's all he has. He's not any better than Biff Wilcox, is that? I love the fight scene that was choreographed by Michael Smeelan. Uh, we brought in, who was doing the San Francisco Ballet at that time. 
In Rumbling Fish, we had a uh, we have a motorcycle gag to do, and what we did is we took a truck and we cabled the truck off to the front of the motorcycle, and we pulled the motorcycle when it got to a certain point on this track that we had made. The stunt man had what's called an air ramp, which flings him back. It's kind of like an automatic trampling. So when you see the finished product, the motorcycle runs down the track, appears to hit this guy and knock him like 10 or 15 feet in the air, and he falls back on some pads. It's all fake. Nobody ever gets hurt in it, of course. Marty, I need to talk to you about some of these figures for the astrobotic sequence. And as you remember, it has to do with... Is that the one, the flying in the alley one? Flying, flying in the alley one. Where we're... We've got a scene where it's called astrobody, and what this involves is a knife fight in an alley, and Matt Dillon, the star of the movie, is supposed to be coming out of his own body and raising up and turning over. So it, they want to shoot it without using any wires. We've made a complete body mold of him. We took him and poured plaster all over him, and then took and poured plaster inside of that mold, and then we took and laid fiberglass over that. So what we have is a cocoon exactly like his body. And we've reinforced that with metal, mounted it on a long rod, and we're gonna mount him inside of it and close it, and we'll be able to pick him up off the ground and rotate him so he can look back on himself without using any wires or cables or anything like that. It looks exactly like a rotisserie. You know he's talking crazy, rambling on about the fish. So you're in that position of wanting to, you know, hey, lay off of him, you know, Patterson, lay off of him. He's not right. If it isn't strange, it isn't right. One of the things that Francis wanted to do was to have the Siamese fighting fish in color to make them really stand out because they were the symbols of the boys fighting. These are Siamese fighting fish. Went through the whole game, we had all these meetings, and when I went back to the office the next day, I said, you know, this is very simple. All we need to do is we'll photograph the fish in color, the water is clear, the gravel is gray, and we'll have a back screen projection of the boys looking in and that's in black and white. And then all we need to do is we'll just cut those sections into the print. And it was a very, very simple solution and that's what we did. Francis, I didn't know you were listening, I swear to God. <coughs> this is like, you know, the technology yeah, thing, you know, I'm a little backwards, they call me a primitive, you know what I mean? Dennis was on Apocalypse with us and we had some pretty crazy times with him then. Line, say yes or no. Let's just shoot. No, oh, wait a second, that's right, wait a second, let's, uh, come on, man. Parker. Let's go on the next minute here, please. 8.15, Cavalry. Can, can I try one more? I think that there was some kind of a record set on Rumblefish, like 47 takes that were done with Dennis Hopper one night. This will be 448 take five. An acute perception, I mean, that doesn't, that doesn't make you crazy. C could you talk more? Like, however, sometimes it can drive you crazy, an acute perception. Francis really pushed him. I wish we'd talk normal, because... And he I got a really great performance out of Dennis in that movie. It's always hard to shoot at night, but when you're shooting a whole whole movie like that, or certainly 90% of it was shot night for night, it was difficult. Cassandra? Yeah. Cassandra? Yeah. I was thinking of leaving that out, too. I think it'd be a good idea. It just drags in an element of the Hey, Mickey, we're going to cut out that line about Cassandra. Yeah, I wasn't using it anyway. Good. Yeah. Matt, the only thing is about the line about the money, just be more by the door, you know? You need some money, I'll get you some money. Okay. Here we go, let's shoot this. I don't know about now, man. I just think it's just person. Rumblefish was the first movie where Nicolas Cage um, was actually Nicolas Coppola. It was his first movie. We don't Rusty you. James. You know I'm gonna be there, man. Smoking being the character of Smokey, he came from Japan in terms of management. He came from Shakespeare in terms of Iago. And he came from Florence in terms of Machiavelli. And also, when I was uh, young, I remembered an event when I went to the neighborhood ditch, and I was swimming in like the moss and everything. I don't know why I did that, but I came across a very large, a very large lizard. And I noticed that on his face he had a smile, and then he went so far as to bite me. 
And I realized that the smile wasn't because he was smiling, simply because he just liked to bite, you know. And I put that into the character. And so if you put all these things together, then you get smoky. He also used Lawrence Fishman, who we use in Apocalypse Now. Midget is kind of like Rusty James's uh, guardian angel, this cat, messenger of the gods kind of cat. Tonight, under the arches behind the pet store at about 10 o'clock. So it was a little bit of kind of um, a family affair with Francis in terms of actors and cast. Everybody has an image that they carry around, whether it's intentional or not. And so Rusty James is still got yeah, this umbilical cord thing going with Motorcycle Boy. I think that Patty's trying to get some of that to rub off on her, too. I mean, that's what everybody's after, right? The legend that they all created here, you know, is a bunch of bullshit, you know? I mean, they just made it up because they had nothing else to believe in. After a while, things that you believe in, later on, you see it for what it really is, like kind of like an illusion, you know? And he sees everything like that now.